I want you to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 7 this morning. And, and, and in our notes it starts in verse 13, but just as I prepared this morning, God just began to draw my attention and, and, and anybody who's, who's been in one service know how much of a, 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 of a stickler I am for context. Mm-hmm. Come on. Yep. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set the tone today by saying this. Today's about staying in your place. Today's about us resetting the narrative of life. Amen? Now let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. He says, Judge not that you be not judged. Now let's stop right there. How many of you have had somebody take that and try to poke you in the eye with it when you were put in a position that you had to judge a thing? See, there's a difference between judging a thing and judging a person. We have to, the Bible says, prove all things. So there is a place where we must judge a thing. None of us stand in the position to judge a person. Come on. And there is a difference. Because when it says judge not lest you be judged, in the literal Greek translation it says this. Do not judge with unfavorable judgment. See, unfavorable judgment hears one side of one thing and makes a conclusion. Aren't you glad that God didn't do that for you? Because He looked at the narrative of our, of our lives down through uh, all of time and eternity and without this, the other side of the story that contains the shed blood of our Savior, He would judge us worthy of hell. So how many of you want to reset the narrative on some things for your own life? That not only do you not want to judge a thing, you don't want to be judged unfavorably. He says this, verse 2. He says, For with the judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, and behold, there is a plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, there's a plank in yours. You hypocrite. Say hypocrite. Hypocrite. Now let me define that for you real quick. Because we throw that word around a lot in our society. A hypocrite is a pretender. Okay? It's someone who pretends to be holy, godly, just, and righteous, but they're more focused on your flaw than their own walk. Might want to write that one down. Come on. Hypocrite! First remove the plank from your eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not... Now listen to this next one very carefully. I would underline or highlight it if you have a highlighter. Do not give what is holy to dogs. Dogs in the scripture always refer to someone outside of the kingdom. Meaning there are situations that you don't share with certain people. Because there are holy things that, 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 that dogs, the world, are not worthy to hear until they come to Jesus. That's good. Come on. See, our problem, I'm, I'm going to tell you what, I hope you brought your steel toe boots. You know, our problem in this society is, is we have let everyone and everything dictate. Listen, we don't even have a bowel movement without publishing it on social media. I'm serious. There is nothing private. There is nothing holy. And people utter all their mind. And and Proverbs calls that a fool. That's right. Listen, it is better to remain silent than to open your mouth and remove all doubt how foolish you are. That's right. See, the silent appear to be very wise. Those who open their mouth, I don't think people understand how foolish they look. Get ready. Come on, bring it. Do you know it is not possible to always be right and righteous? Because your behavior can take you out of a place of being righteous. You might be right, 
But what if that caused somebody to stumble? You don't live for yourself. He says, don't give what is holy to dogs, nor cast your pearl before swine. We got a clear picture here? Lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Now, I'm going to, for context sake, go 7 through 12 there. He says, ask, and it will be given. See, He wants you to ask. It will be given. Seek, you'll find. Knock, and it will be open. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be open. Or what man among you, if his son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts how much to your children, rather, how much more your Father in heaven will He give you good things to those who ask? Therefore, whatever you want... Now, 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 I want you to highlight this one. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Why are we in such chaos in our nation? Because they're doing what was done to them rather than they want what they want done to them. Mm-hmm. You'll never change behavior by doing to somebody what was done to you. And as the holy children of God, you have to change what you do. Jesus said, if they strike you on a cheek, turn the other. If they ask you to go one mile, go two. We are servants of the living God. We don't represent ourselves. So everything else outside of this has to fall by the wayside. It doesn't mean you change your values. It doesn't mean you change your stand. But it changes how you stand. See, the Bible calls us to be wise as a serpent. Gentle as a dove. What does a serpent do? Sometimes a serpent, you don't even know where, you don't even know it's there. But we got people, not only in the nation, but unfortunately in the church. That's right. I'm talking about church corporate, so don't get nervous. But if the shoe fits, put it on. <laughs> <laughs> who don't know how to be wise as a serpent. They get the lion and the lamb mixed up with the serpent. Mm-hmm. There's a time to roar and there's a time to be silent. Mm-hmm. We're actually in a place where, where both are needed, but you're going to have to grow up. Uh-oh. We're all going to have to grow up. Because Paul said a foolish argument doesn't lead to righteousness. It doesn't lead people into the kingdom. Hallelujah. If it feels like a rebuke, it is. Hey, we have to set the narrative. We don't let anybody or anything but this Word and the leading of the Holy Spirit set the narrative. And it is high time ministers started standing up and setting the example. Come on. Come on. Preach it. You might not agree when I get done, so be, ca- be careful. What you, be careful what you're amening. No, no, you can't pick and choose. I'm not the Rick Barker of 20 years ago. All right. Come on now. Verse 13 says, enter the narrow gate. Say the narrow gate. Narrow. You know, there's a, there's a narrative in the church today. Well, I preach the wide way because we just want to get everybody in. Getting them in the building doesn't get them in heaven. That's right. I don't need a gimmick. You know, it, 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 I was thinking this week. I went to a, to a service last year where Tim Tebow spoke. And, and I love Tim Tebow's witness for Christ. That's not the problem. The problem is I, I, I watched as over four services, about 40,000 people crammed into a building because 
of a man's reputation mm -hmm. rather than who the man represented. Amen. Come on, that's right. Because in the parking lot, it was anything but godly. Oh, man. See, when we go to a service because of who's in the pulpit, we've gone for the wrong reason. That's right, man. While I'm gone at my stepson's wedding, don't you dare decide, oh, our pastor's not here, I'm not going. Because I'm going to tell you what, then you're here for the wrong reason. That's right. Amen. Dr. Lemon is speaking next Sunday, but I tell you, no matter who was here, God has a powerful word. Why? Because part of this trip, I'm on assignment. Part of this trip, I get to take my bride on a honeymoon we never had with my mother-in-law. <laughs> Come on. What a privilege. I get to honor my mother-in-law. See, I'm not the guy who's going to make fun of and demean his mother-in-law. No, 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 no. No, how I operate is, listen, before she even liked me, I paid for her pedicure. Come on. It's true, isn't it? The Bible tells us to speak the truth. Come on. See, you bless those who curse you. You do good to those who use and spitefully persecute you. Reset the narrative of your life. That's good. Come on. He said, broad. Whoo! Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. See, destruction, it's the word apolia. Apo means a way, okay? Apolia, destruction. It means destruction and ruin. It's the destruction and misery of an eternity in hell. See, the broad way leads to hell. If you could see in the realm of the Spirit in a lot of churches today, you'd see an open pit. Why? Because we just going to accept everybody and everything. And we don't want to be too excitable now. <laughs> we don't want to share too many scriptures. In fact, you know what? Let's just say it's in the Bible. Oh, and, and, and you know, if you need prayer, there's a quiet little prayer room. We're in private. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. Amen. Baptism is a declaration to the public, I have made Jesus the Lord of my life. And unfortunately in America, we have set a narrative that said it's just a private thing. No, 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 no. no. In other nations... I, I, I've been in former communist countries in the Ukraine and, and, and I've been in Central America and in Haiti and I'm going to tell you what when that declaration is made it is made public at the risk of life when gang members from MS-13 get saved it's a risk of life when former witch doctors get saved in the nation of Haiti it's a risk of life No, but we want convenient. You know, Pastor, you went to 1201 and I just don't know if I can keep coming here because you went two hours and one minute. Right. Well, you're going to spend eternity with Jesus. Are you going to check out on Him too? Come on. Amen. Let's see how your boss feels if you check out at 459 and you were supposed to work till 5. Oh, come on. See, why would we give honor to a man we can see, to a company we can see when... <laughs> when we minimize the God we can't see. Because there's no way you're going to tell me you worship and serve God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength who you cannot see when you can't honor. Say honor. honor. No, look at this. He says narrow is the gate. Difficult. Say difficult. difficult. See, this is a place that you're crowded in. There's no wiggle room. Difficult is the way that leads to life and there are few who find it. You know why few are finding it? Because few are speaking it. 
They're more interested in their opinions. They're more interested in what is popular than someone's eternal destiny. Doing what I do isn't all flash and glory. But I'm going to tell you what. It's full of blessing. Why? Because I do not care what any human being thinks. I'm going to please God first. And if that offends somebody, then they're offended at God, not me. Come on. Now look at verse 15. He says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Now, now there's a couple of ways we can look at this. Notice what kind of sh clothing they're wearing. Sheep. I don't know if you've ever seen that graphic where, where there's a, a sheep skin over a wolf's head. Mm -hmm. Something's amiss. Yeah. See, sometimes, yes, there are false prophets. There are people who will teach a message that will tickle your ears, that will, that will coddle your sin, and allow you to live how you want and say, well, we're all saved by grace. That's not grace. The word grace is the word kadis. It's where we get the word charisma. It's where we get the word anointing. And it means the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection through the life. So what is the fruit of your life? See, the world is watching our fruit. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but they are inwardly ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown where? Does that sound like the pearly gates and the golden streets? No, no sir. <laughs> see, you might be able to fool everybody that you see in the natural. But you'll never be able to fool the God who sees everything. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says that they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. That means there are churches today that have a form of godliness, but there are 18 characteristics that you and I had better beware of. I didn't plan to go there, but we're going to. 2 Timothy 3. Why? Because this is God's service, not mine. Come on. Come on. You don't watch it. I'm going to preach to you from Ireland next Sunday. Let Dr. Lemon sit here in the, in the seats. I wouldn't do that to Dr. Mimmon. But I might do it the next Sunday. I'll be in Rome. I'm going to go stand out in front of the, uh, out in front of the cathedral uh, you know, in the Vatican City and preach to you. How about that? Amen. Amen. Anyway, uh, hallelujah. I was never Catholic, but I did go to a lot of Catholic masses for funerals. So uh, I picked up a lot. I learned. Hey, praise God. But this, now look, look at this. Verse 1 of chapter 3. He says, know this. When you see the word know, the Holy Spirit is making an emphatic statement. Know this. In the last days, perilous times will come. Times that are hard to bear. Times of great upheaval. Now look at this. For men will be lovers of themselves. Now for years... I applied that to the thinking of what's going on in the world. But let's set the context here. Drop down to verse 5. It says, having a form of godliness. The world doesn't have a form of godliness. So what is he telling you to do? Look out for the lovers of themselves in the church. Amen. Lovers of self. Lovers of money. Listen, there is no such thing as a poverty gospel, so let's just get that off the table right now. Okay? God wants you blessed, but He doesn't want your blessings ruling your life. 
When your focus and attention becomes the size of the plane you have, the size of the house you have, the type of car you drive, and the size of your bank account, you become a lover of money. Because if your heart's right, all of those things I mentioned are tools for the kingdom. So there's a difference. He says boasters, proud, blasphemers. See, it's people who take the holy things of God and neutralize and minimize them. That's blasphemy. Telling me that today is not a day for the Spirit of God to move? That's blasphemy. Because if he, if he stopped moving, then your salvation's null and void. He hasn't stopped moving. The greatest miracle is not the healing of your body, but the transformation of your spirit. Blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. Now, you got two sets of parents in life if you're born again. Not just a mom and a dad. You have your natural parents who birthed you, who gave you life, who conceived you. But if you're born again, you've got spiritual parents. Amen. See, this is where the devil has set the narrative, even in the church, where people don't want spiritual parents. See, a good godly spiritual parent isn't a heavy hand. They're not an ogre. They're not, they're not some, some... I mean, think about your own self. How many of you are parents in the room? Would you abuse your child? Then no spiritual leader should abuse a child right. in the faith. Mm -hmm. But because some have, we want to dismiss them all. Right. Well, that doesn't give us a pass. Guys, and some of you know my testimony and parts of it, I could, listen... I know Lance would get real angry if I shared with him all the things people had done to me in the years, and he'd say, what's the address? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Come on. <clears throat> Disobedient to parents. See, submission, the word hupatasa, submission, is a, is a submission that's given. It's a submission that is on the basis of relationship and trust and love. I refuse to do anything that would dishonor God with my role as a leader. But I also refuse to be silent on things that I need to speak up about. And if that comes in the form of correction, it comes in the form of correction, not because I feel some, some need for an ego boost to, to, to live someone else's life. I, I don't have time to live your life. i got to do my best to give you the correction of the Word the instruction from the Word, encourage you in the Word, and whether or not you obey it is not up to me. If you posture yourself, well, I'm just not going to obey. Who do you think you are? Well, I don't really think I'm anything other than His. It's in His Word. Take it or don't. If I share it with you and it's from His Word, then the responsibility is no longer on my hands. If I don't share it with you, and here's where a lot of ministers are going to get in a lot of trouble with God. They have not brought the correction of the Word to the people they're responsible to lead, and they're leading them in deception. Because wouldn't it be unjust as a parent if I saw a destructive behavior in my child and I didn't attempt to correct it? Then all of a sudden it's on me. See, a loving, nurturing parent or even spiritual father sees things, brings it to attention by the Word in a spirit of love. And you know what? The only thing that upsets me and grieves my heart is when I watch people turn away from that truth. Mm -hmm. Because, listen, you can do anything, say anything about me that you want to say. I don't care. But it grieves my heart if you... Re if you rebel against what he says. You know, I often tell people, because 
you know, as pastor, people come and say, Pastor, what is your opinion? I always respond this way. My opinion is not as important as what His Word says. And if my opinion is in conflict with what His Word says, then my opinion must change. Very good. Therefore, I make a choice, and I make it my goal, that everything I have an opinion on have something from the Word to base it on. See, if I'll do that, then, then the pressure of the world... Even now, 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 listen with an open ear. Even the movements of man won't sway me from this position. And that's where we have to grow up as the body of Christ. Too many believers, I'm watching them. You don't think I see stuff on social media? I see it all. <coughs> Too many people let other things sway them. You know what that's called? The winds of doctrine. Because mm -hmm. doctrine isn't just in church. Doctrine rests in governments and in nations and in companies. The only thing that sets our foundation. I mean, we sing in Christ alone. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Why can't they fix all the problems? Because they're on sinking sand. That's right. That's right. Church, yeah. let's be the change we say we want. Yeah, that's right. You don't do that. The Bible says in the book of James, the wrath of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. It says that Stephen stood there looking to heaven while they stoned him to death for telling the truth. See, what price are you willing to, 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 to pay to stay at your post? To stay true to God. To stay true to the Word. He says, unthankful. Whew. I could preach a whole sermon on that one. Come on. The ingratitude of so many today in and out of church. That's right. Unthankful. Well, it's your job. You're the pastor. Uh, excuse me. God didn't call me to be your source. And He didn't call the church to be your source. He's our source. That's right. Unholy. Unloving. See, before you ever take another step of action in your life, ask yourself, would the love of God do what I'm about to do. Amen. Oh. Amen. Do you know that five second pause could save you a whole lot of trouble? Yes. Just like 15 minutes on the internet will save you insurance money with Geico? I don't know. <laughs> um. <laughs> no, no. Our problem is we have diarrhea of the mouth. Wow. That's right. And we don't stop ourselves with enough self control and restraint through love before we post a post, we make a call, we send a text, we do whatever it is we're doing. That's right. That's good. Ask yourself if, if I were standing before God today on the day of judgment and this action was judged, would it have been an action founded in the agape love of God that gives to someone who is undeserving a response they do not deserve? Oh my Unloving, unforgiving. Slanderers. See, a slanderer takes a weakness they know in someone's life and amplifies it so they look better. I always will caution you. If someone comes into your life talking about and amplifying the weakness of another more than they're willing to be transparent and show you their faults, walk away. Amen. What you see right here 
in my life and in Pastor Amy's life is what you get. Why would I live differently here than I live there? Slanderers. Because if you come and ask me about certain ministries, I'll tell you to stay away, but I'm not going to slander them. I'll tell you why to stay away principally. I might not even name their name. But there are a lot of churches I'd stay away from. Not because I want to build an empire here and pull people in here unnecessarily. No, but because I know the compromises and I know the heresies that are being taught. I mean, I, I saw an event this weekend, uh, 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 you know, in our city uh, with women where they were up there doing the electric slide before the meeting. I mean, come on, what are we doing? They ought to be at the altars pressing in in prayer and worship to God, believing for the women who come in that door who need Jesus. Not doing the electric slide because it's relevant. Mm -hmm. Please. There's a church in, in another state. I'll just say it that way. They play country music pre-service. Now, listen... My roots are in Nashville, Tennessee. My mama's family is all from there. I love country music. <laughs> but it is not what I'm going to worship God with. <laughs> and if it's talking about beer sipping and sleeping around, I'm not going to listen to it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> we have lost our minds. We have forsaken the mind of Christ and we thought we had to have a gimmick. We're going to electric slide in the church. I mean, and think, well, they'll come in because we're playing the electric slide. <laughs> well, you sell $50 a person tickets and make money on the gospel. Uh -uh. That's not the same as receiving an offering from a willing heart. No, it's not. It's disgusting. Disgusting. And it's time to call it out. Yes. Right. My pastor is holding a conference this week that Pastor Amy and I will be a part of. Do you know he doesn't charge for his conferences? They set a budget, they receive offerings, and they believe God. Amen. 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 That's right. That's what it should be. Anywhere he goes in the country, he does three Holy Spirit conferences a year. He does San Diego, California, Midland, Michigan, and now in West uh, uh, Palm Coast, not West Palm, Palm Coast, Florida. Hallelujah. That's not cheap when you take a team, he has what, 30 people, easily, yes, sir. easily that he brings from Michigan to wherever he has a meeting. <coughs> he has never, ever charged a fee. For one thing, why would you limit <laughs> God? Right. Well, you know, we got to at least break even, brother. <laughs> then you're doing it for the wrong reason. Because the last I checked, God has exceeded every faith project we have set out on. Amen. See, last Sunday we stood up here and we just called in. We're, we're not only going to pay for the missionaries to go to, to the Dominican Republic, we're going to sow a seed equivalent to our Thank you, mission costs. Amen. Hey, let's stop looking at an amount and let's accomplish the goal. That's right. That's exactly do you know amounts can change? But uh, God made an adjustment. This week we were listening to Pastor Nancy Dufresne talk about faith for the finish, and I'm like, oh man, that's good. Stop believing for your budget in terms of numbers, and let's, let's believe in terms of completion. Amen. Amen. I, won't, I won't charge anything for that last statement. <laughs> he says this, without self-control, Brutal, despisers of good, traitors, traitors. Walking both sides of the fence in the body of Christ. That's a traitor. Mm -hmm. Trying to walk in the light, say you're in the light and you're in the club Saturday night. 
Come on. I'm watching people's feed who I know, the church they go to, and on Saturday night, 1 o'clock in the morning, woo, woo! Come on. And on Sunday morning, they check in at such and such a church. You're a traitor. Listen, I'm not judging you. I'm telling you, you can't be hot and cold. That's what he told the Laodiceans. He said, you're lukewarm. You're riding both sides of the house. He can't do it. Amen. Oh, come on now. Come on. Despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, won't listen, don't want wisdom, but want vision. Mm-mm. If you don't want my wisdom, please don't ask me. But if you want and ask for my wisdom and how God has done what He's done through my life, be respectful of God enough yes. to apply it. That's right. See, so your mentor, your pastor, whoever they are, your leader, is not the one who you listen to. It's one whose wisdom you apply. Oh, come on. You don't have to do what I do, but I'm telling you what, there are wisdom principles that cannot be changed in everything we do. Yeah. I've walked a road. You've walked a road. Wouldn't it be disrespectful in your field of expertise if some new person, let's we'll, we'll take nursing for a second, a CNA comes into the clinic. You're what, RN? Mm -hmm. RN. Not LPN. Not CNA. A CNA just came from HCC. <laughs> and they want to tell Crystal how to do her job. Yeah, I watch ministers do it all the time. Listen, I caution Bible college students all the time. Don't get a year or two under your belt and think you know it all. Stay till it hurts. Stay till you're so concerned about stepping out, we got to push you out. <laughs> then you might have a little knowledge. <laughs> the CNA is going to run in there. Have you seen this, Crystal? It still happens. Yeah. still happens. The CNA runs in there and wants to tell the doctor her job. <laughs> My sister's a speech therapist at the VA. I mean, I can guarantee you she's had students come in there and tell her what's what. You know those people will never finish. Come on. Nope. Nothing wrong with being a CNA. Sure. But know the limits of where you are. Listen, when I first came in ministry, I had the opportunity to so much to speak, be a fly on the wall with some of the greatest men and women of God that you'll ever meet. Do you know, I made it a discipline to not say a word because there's not a thing I can offer to them. But there's a whole lot I can learn from them. Amen. When I go to lunch with Dr. Lemon, I ask questions. Mm -hmm. Doc, what do you think about this? Yeah. When I have coffee with my pastor, Dr. Barclay, Pastor, here's what I'm sensing in my spirit. Now, what do you think? And then I just sit and listen. Why? That's wisdom. We always want to be attached to someone who is farther than where we are. Yeah. No matter how far we go. That's right. Yeah. Hey, you may not like your CEO of your company, but he knows something you don't know or he wouldn't be the CEO. That's right. And if you ever hope to have something of your own, you'll listen for it and watch yeah. and observe and receive the wisdom that will allow you, if you're anointed to be in business, to, to rise to be the owner. I used to tell this kid, he's in the ministry now, I think. <laughs> he used to work at McDonald's. His name's Kenny. I said, Kenny, nothing wrong with working at McDonald's, but unless you're going to own it, it is not the place to park. Right. 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 Why would you? Listen, nothing wrong with, with flipping burgers. If that's where you are, hey, if that gives you passion, then learn to be a burger chef. Amen. Open your own. That's Come right. on. Why would I let someone else set my limit? See, that's what the godly do. 
They don't set limits. They, they receive wisdom and say, okay, God, whatever I'm called to do, whatever I'm designed to be, God, put around me people that I can grow with. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That's my introduction. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go back to Matthew 7. Look at verse 9. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm interjecting here for a second. I'll go down to 21 in just a second. See, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, that's where I was going. Jesus, in the, in, in the Beatitudes sermon, He said this. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Now, you might nudge your neighbor and say, what's a peacemaker? Go ahead. What's a peacemaker? What's a peacemaker? See, in our world, we think a peacemaker demands peace at any cost. No, that's a peacekeeper. Because what they, they're doing is they are driving an atmosphere that whoever I have to step on, whatever I have to do, we're going to have peace. Do you know it never leads to peace? That's why they have to remain in territories militarily occupying. Do those occupiers, do, do, do they walk around with their arms like this and unarmed? No. They're armed, right? To the teeth. To the teeth. Why? Because there are opportunists. There are people who don't respect peace. But see, as Christians, we're called to be peacemakers. See, a peacemaker uses their call, their gifting, and their influence to change atmospheres. See, as a Christian, we are called to be peacemakers. Does that mean we don't, we never ever, you know, it doesn't mean, guys, that, that, that you can't have a, a concealed weapon. That's not what that means. It means that your first step is not to reach for it. Your first step is using your gifting, your calling, and your influence to make a difference. See, our problem is, is oftentimes when someone offends us, we reach for the weapon. It's usually coming right here from between our two lips. Oh, come on. That's right. It's a sword of our tongue that lashes out and tears down people, disrupts things. When the Bible says, Proverbs, it says, a soft answer turns away wrath. It says a grievous word stirs up strife. Matthew 5, uh, 7, verse 21. Now listen to this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice. Say practice. practice. See, what is your habitual lifestyle? Is it one of law toward God of law or lawlessness against man? It can't be both. I learned a long time ago, this ties into submission again, my submission to any authority that is seen can only stop the, the minute that it begins to compromise what is here. Meaning if an authority that I can see asks me to do what is biblical, what is moral, what is ethical, I am bound by this law to do so. When they step outside of those parameters is the minute I say, I'm sorry, I live by a higher law. I live by a higher law. I live by the law of the Word. Now go to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. In verse 16. 
It says, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires or the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit lusts against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. See, your Spirit is pulling you one way and your flesh is pulling you another. Your flesh, mine and Amy's flesh wanted to cuddle in bed this morning. Right, honey? That's true. But when you walk in the Spirit, you realize that, 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 that Sunday morning belongs to my God. I would be in a church if I wasn't leading one. Because it's not about whether or not I'm speaking on a Sunday. It's about whether or not I'm going to honor Him. Amen. And when He has things going on in the church, I'm going to be there. Amen. I'd be here if whoever stood at this. If I wasn't the pastor here, I'd be here. Come on. Look at verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. See, being led by the Spirit means that things that are wrong should convict you. If you're doing something wrong and it's not bothering you, you've got a problem. You're not being led by the Spirit. I didn't say you weren't saved, but I tell you what, you got a problem. You got at least a blind spot. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Elbow your neighbor and say, It's really obvious when you walk in the flesh. It's really obvious. Come on now. Because he says this. They are adultery. Jesus said, if you even look at a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. See, God raised the bar. He didn't create legalism, but He raised the bar of faith and said, you don't even need to look at a woman to lust after her. That's right. He didn't say, when you take your clothes off, you committed adultery. He said, if you look at her, you committed it. Adultery Fornication, uncleanness, lewdness describes a big chunk of America and the American church. That's true. Amen. That's true. Come on. I'm not being critical. I'm being real. That's right. God cannot move in an unclean environment spiritually. No, what happens is familiar spirits move in there. God will not endorse heresy. God will not endorse unclean leadership. He wants them to get it right, but I'm telling you right now, they're dropping like flies. Either their sin's being exposed and it is causing the collapse of their empire, or some are literally just dropping dead. Man, we've got to have a holy reverence and a holy fear that, that, that we will not do anything in our lives. Because guess what? That leadership doesn't just mean those who stand at the front of the room. It's everybody in the church because God has called the church to be leaders in the world. This is an equipping meeting. I'm looking around the room and everybody I see is born again. Therefore, this is not an evangelistic outreach. This is an equipping meeting. This is a place where iron sharpens iron. This is a place where the tools are being put in the tool belt so when you go out into this world, you are an honor, you are a reflection, you are a, you are a glory to God because you're equipped and you're ready. You're looking around you saying, who needs healing? You're looking around you saying, who needs deliverance? You're looking around you say, say, what injustice do I need to stand up for like Amy and I did at a Walmart? Uh, oops. At a store. <laughs> when some fella throws something at an employee. See, stop dovetailing on somebody else's nonsense and somebody else's issue and start looking around you and you'll make a difference. That's true. I say it this way. We are called to expose darkness. Amen. Now, that doesn't mean we stand on someone else's platform. That means we got our heads up, our eyes open, our hands to the plow, that everywhere we go, we become agents of change. We become the peacemakers. Amen. We 
do not disregard. We do not dishonor God by our actions or our words. Now listen to this. Fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies. I'm letting these pause and think in, you know, sink in for a second. Jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition. That's where I wanted to go. Now the word selfish ambition is the word erythea. It means factions, contentions. It is electioneering for an office. Uh oh. It comes from the desire to put one's own agenda and desires above everyone else's. It is a partisan, fractious spirit. It denotes a self seeking and a pursuit of political desire by unfair means, specifically, it is the pursuit of a selfish desire. And don't think I'm just talking about the politics of America. It's in the church, too. Yeah, it is. When someone will treat someone better because of what they can gain advantage of out of their life in the church and disregard the person of another, that's selfish ambition. I know what I described there. Sounds just like America. The problem is, the problem is not in any political office. The problem is in the church. That's right. We have created congregation rule environments. <coughs> God's church government is the fivefold. That means the fivefold don't even get to vote. <laughs> we get to obey. Come on. I don't get to say, I don't get to spin the wheel or roll the dice and say, okay, God, what can I do next? No, I have to listen on the inside. And even if it costs me everything, including my life, I've got to obey. Amen. Mm -hmm. I'll swear to my own hurt. I mean, please understand this is not self-promotion or anything like that. Any of you who've been here any length of time know my heart. We got married and started a church. No honeymoon. We crucified our desires. We kept trying to plan and trying to plan and trying to plan a kind of reception or something, you know, and, 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 and saying we'll do this and we'll do that. And, and it just didn't happen. Why? Because we can't live by our desire alone. Now, God will honor the sacrifice. I'm going to tell you what, I am going to enjoy Ireland. Amen. I'm, going to enjoy, I'm going to enjoy London and the bridges are not falling down. Amen. I'm going to enjoy Rome and I'll say hi to the Pope for you. you. I'm going to enjoy Florence. I'm going to enjoy my family. I'm going to enjoy my wife. And I'm going to pray for you. I don't feel bad about it. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have a second thought about it. That's right. <laughs> Why? God opened this door. God made a way. Never apologize for the things that God opens the door for and opens a way for. Right. Too many in the world and in the church want you to feel bad about your blessings. No, 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 no. That dishonors God. Yeah. No, we need to celebrate it. We need to, if some, the Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice. That's right. Weep with those who weep. We've done a lot of weeping. <laughs> it's time to do some rejoicing. <laughs> Come on. I mean, in one weekend, we had three funerals. Yeah, Added four families. Come on. you can't live by selfish ambition. Then it says dissensions. 
Well, I tell you what, if I was pastor, I'd do such and such. Well, go start your church. I'll pray for you. God bless you. I'm not threatened by that. See, that's a dissension when someone says what they would do better. See, it's a dissension in your work environment when people start gabbing and talking, well, if I was in charge, that, that. well, you're not in charge. Be the best you can be so you could be in charge one day. Be faithful with what somebody else is responsible for. Tell your boss, even if you don't like them, I am here to get you a promotion. So I'm going to do my job the best I can do my job. I'm going to honor my God because whether or not I like you is irrelevant. Amen. Oh, come on. Come on. I've told bosses who were out to get me, I am here to get you promoted. You know why things come against you? Because of who's inside of you. Amen. Amen. Don't, don't get all arrogant and think it's because of what your skin is or isn't or where you came from or you didn't or, or any of that. Man, there is a much higher target on your life. Much higher target. Listen, you could go to regions of the world where your skin matched theirs and you're going to get treated differently because of who you are. I watched on my team as, listen, the black people on my team in Haiti were treated as bad as the white. Come on. Why? Because of who's in you. You can go to all white countries and because of who's in you, they're going to target you. It's not just because you're American. See, there's a, there's a war in the Spirit. And that war is designed to even keep the church in fighting against itself, race against race, background against background, denomination against denomination, and God saying, Stop it! That's right. Speak it. Well, I'm going to speak it because the next time I hear anybody platform any political statement in a service, I'm going to stop and correct you. We are Christians first. We are Americans second. And I don't care whose party you're affiliated with. Let's get back to a place of honor. Amen. Instead of acting dishonorably in this nation and in churches. Amen. Come on. Amen. You can do what you want on your social media post. I'm not going to control that. But when it comes to God's house... We're all brothers and sisters in Christ if we know Jesus. That's right. Amen. That's right. Do you know that my views 30 years ago were very different than today? Mm-hmm. Why? Because I let God change me. That's right. That's right. Amen. So, so when you see someone with a differing or a varying view, don't, don't, don't rail on them. Yes. Love them. That's right. Amen. Bring them the Word. Amen. See, I'm done posting anything that has anything to do with anything. Did I get you? Anything? <laughs> but the Word. Amen. This is my grandbabies or my wife. <laughs> and if you say something negative on there, I'm going to come get you. I'm going to talk about my babies or my baby. Come on. It's time. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. You know, for me, when I write a message, some of it might just be for me. Now, I'll post my notes if I don't get to everything today. And you can use that for your study this week, devotions and everything. But what's most important about staying on our post is staying obedient. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, say does them. This is the word paeo. It means to act rightly, to do well, to make ready such things as are ready for the Passover. See, See, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I'll liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it didn't fall, for it was founded on the rock. 
But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house and it fell. Notice the storm came to both sides. That's right. The pressure is coming to you whether you are doing the word or you're not. But I can tell you by how I see you stand whether or not you're doing the word. Because if the wind and the rain and the waves are beating upon you and you are waffling under that pressure, you've got to change the foundation. Amen. Thank God that God is a God of new beginnings. You can lose it all and He'll let you build it right on the right foundation and He will take you farther than you ever thought you could go. But it's why we become a reproach to the world around us when we say things and don't do them. When we say we believe a, a standard of God and won't walk it. But I'm going to tell you what. If Pastor Amy and myself had not been on solid ground, we wouldn't have endured the first week of dating. That's true. Seriously. We had people come from against us from the beginning to divide us. We got married and had ministers who tried to divide us in a meeting. And then when that didn't work, the minister came across the table at me, threatening me. Then we started church. Then all our family lost their brain. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. We love them. Listen. Our battle is not with flesh and blood. That's right. Amen. That's why you don't stop. It doesn't matter who comes against you, who says what, who comes across the table at you. You don't stop obeying God. Amen. If you... If you have that determination, no matter what pressure comes against you, you won't collapse. Amen. And you won't fail. Amen. Because people will come and go, and they will fall by the wayside, but you will stand. Miss Debbie, I remember something that you said to me that April said it, she always remembered about me. Always had the heart to serve. Guys, don't seek to be known. Seek to be great. Because the great are the ones who serve. And I'm not saying that to tout me. My testimony from others is why I can stand. Because I only want to serve. That doesn't change. No matter who knows my name, no matter how far I go in God, no matter the accomplishment, I just want to serve. Because when I get to heaven, that's all that's going to matter. Amen. So doing what God says means completing a task. I'm going to have you write this one down. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. It says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. That's a godly fear, by the way. That's not a fear of repercussion for not doing your work. Why? Because I don't work for you. You know, if you'll get out of your mind that you work for somebody and understand you're working for God, you'll change how you work. Come on. I'm not saying that excuses anybody's treatment of anyone. But I'm going to tell you what, if they mistreat you, think about it. Think about what you would do if someone mistreated your child. Mm -mm. How much more God the Father? Mm -hmm. When you say, I am, listen, <laughs> you treat me how you want, you do what you want. I'm walking in a godly fear and there is a God in the unseen realm whom I serve and He'll promote me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they made a determination we are not going to bow and we are not going to burn. Amen. They didn't bow to the pressure of Nebuchadnezzar who, who then, because they wouldn't bow their knee to an idolatrous king, an idolatrous kingdom, because they wouldn't bow their knee, he threw them in a furnace that was turned up seven times hotter. As though that would make a difference. Come on. 
No, that's just a reflection that the anger of the world continues to intensify. But when our commitment to God is unshakable and unmovable, we'll walk right out of it unharmed. We'll walk right out of it because it says they walked out of there and they got promoted. Amen. See, your boss is about to change his opinion about you if you walk into godly fear. Come on. Be submissive with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. That word harsh is where we get the word scoliosis. It means twisted. So there are tw some guys, they ain't no denying there's some twisted folk in this nation. Come on. But like Elijah standing in front of the prophets of Baal, <laughs> we're not backing off the assignment. And our God will answer by fire. I'm going to tell you what, you're getting ready to see some demonstrations of God like have never been seen in our day and time. Why? Because there are people like you and like me who will stand and who will not bow, who will not buckle, who will stand for righteousness. Amen. Not compromising my message to please anyone. And he says this, For it's commendable if because of conscience sake toward God one endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if you're beaten for your faults? You take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in His steps. Look at this. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in His mouth. When He was reviled, didn't revile in return. When He suffered, He didn't threaten. But He committed Himself to Him who judges righteous. If we're going to take a stand, we commit ourselves to the one who judges righteously no matter what anything else says. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to be great and do great things? Mark chapter 9 I want you to turn over there, verse 35, or 33, I'm sorry. Come on. 33. Mark 9, 33. Next, actually just back up to verse 32 so we know what's, being, what's going on here. And when they were on the road going to Jerusalem, Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. And he looked at the twelve again and began to tell them these things. Actually, I'm in the wrong chapter. That's a good, good, good chapter, but I'm not going, that doesn't read that way. I know what I'm looking for. Okay, verse 33 in chapter 9. See, I was in chapter 10. So you can just take that on your devotional. All right. It says, and he came to Capernaum, and as he went in the house, he asked them, saying, What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they all kept silent. For on the road, they disputed among themselves as to who would be the greatest. And he sat down and he called the twelve together and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant. Say servant. Servant. That word servant is the word diakonos means one who executes the commands of another, an attendant, a minister. In the New Testament is the office by which one was charged with the care of the poor and the distribution of the resources that were committed for the poor. We'll get into it at some point in the future. I don't know when. But in the Old Covenant, there were three tithes. It was a tithe to God. There was a tithe to you. Today we call that a savings account. In other words, take 10% and put it in your savings. Imagine that. That's unheard of today. Oh, but I got bills. That's why you got bills. The third tithe was called a tithe for the poor. See, God intended the church to be the system by which the poor were taken care of. Amen. When we live that way, and principally as a church, we live that way. We try to live on 70%. And we live a whole lot better than if we tried to eat up all the hundred. 
we give in excess of 20%. That's not to, 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 to boast, but I'm telling you, it's a principle. If we're going to be great, we've got to be a servant of all. Amen. And that doesn't mean that we have stores of money and we can just go write blank checks to everybody. No, we're stewards of what we have. And as stewards of what we have, God always meets the need because He's not moved by what our bank account says. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. He's moved by obedient hearts that say, what was that you said to do, God? See, the greatest in the kingdom is the one who's, who'll be a servant of all. In Philippians 2, verse 5 through 11, it says, Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of a servant, who being in the form of God, rather, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant. That word is the word doulos, and it means one who is a slave who gives himself to the will of another, whose service is used by Christ to extend and advance His calls amongst humanity. I'm not my own. I'm a bond servant of Christ. I become all things to all people. That doesn't mean that I go get an ear piercing and a bunch of tattoos no. to try to be relevant. Amen. No. It, Amen. People will look at me and say, has that man, has that 49 year old man lost his mind? Mm -hmm. You know, it's the guys who, who, who they go get the trendy cut and they get the ear piercing and they get the nice tattoo and they put on the skinny jeans and they're not skinny. Yeah, come, on. Come, on. come on. No. Becoming all things to all people is how can I serve you? What can I do to make your life better? What can I do to advance God's cause in your life? Amen. <coughs> That's a servant of the king. I don't need a gimmick. Now I'm just going to tell you the story and I'm going to assign you 2 Kings chapter 2. Elisha was to become prophet in the place of Elijah. And for over 20 years, Elisha had the reputation that he poured water on the hands of Elijah. Right. And there came the time, there always does, that the man of God would be taken from his servant. And his servant would be installed in his office. And Elijah says, I have been called to go to this place. You stay here. Do you know what most people would do today? If their man of God said, well, I've been called to, 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 to go start a church in another country... You stay here. Everybody say, alright, that sounds good to us. We love you. We're praying for you. We'll send an offering sometimes. Maybe. Maybe. If it's convenient. Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I'll not leave you. They come up to the school of the prophets. The prophets are, are in Elisha's ear. Your master's going to get taken from you today. He said, I know. Be quiet. See, see, our problem, we say, we, we get our ear out and we say, really? Oh no. Oh, are they going to die? What's going to happen? Are they committing adultery? Uh, see, we get, we get people that come and tickle our ears. Sent, we think they're sent by God and really the enemy has influenced even some godly people to say some things they shouldn't say. Just ask Job. Come on. Come on. It is nonsense to say they were his comforters. They were his tormentors. And at the end of Job, God said, They have said of me what is not right. I didn't send them. You tell them they bring you an offering. They bring you a sacrifice and I'll forgive them. He keeps going. You just stay here, Elisha. As, your, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, I'm not departing from you. Gets to the sea. Gets to the Jordan. Smacks the Jordan. Water parts. Walks across. The prophet's on that side. Do you know God's taking your master from you? Shut up. You hold your peace. 
Now, Elisha, you just stay here. I'm going to go on. As the Lord God lives and as your soul lives, I'll not leave you. And as they're walking, Elijah says, Now, son, I'm going home today. What do you want? See, are you committed to your post? That the ones that you serve on behalf of the king, you will stay by their side as the Lord lives and as their soul lives, you won't leave your post. Because a blessing is imparted when we'll say, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I'm not leaving. See, we got to be so faithful to the point that we could walk them to, if it was death's door, they would say, so what do you want? You know, when a, when a guy like Dr. Lemon comes into your life and says, I feel led to, to be a spiritual dad to you, and he's 84 years old, do you know, there'll, there'll be a day where he's going to, to go home. Three times he's laid his hands on me. Now I'm going to impart, I'm going to bless you with an apostolic blessing. I'll not leave your side, Doc. I'll not leave your side, Dad. See, 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 that's what's missing in the church today is spiritual fathers. Amen. That we will honor and that we will respect and we'll say, I want what you got inside of you because you've forgotten more than I know. Amen. Amen. And Elijah says, I want, Elisha says, I want a double portion of the anointing that's on you. Amen. And Elijah, Amen. I can just see it. The, the smirk on his face. Son, you don't know what you're asking for. I just got chased by Jezebel. I had 450 prophets of Baal trying to take my life. Uh, do you really want double what I got? Because it'll come with double the pressure, double the persecution, double the criticism. Do you really want it? Are you will, really willing, Elisha, are you really willing, church, to pay the price? Amen. Because we are not limited by the double. You're not limited by anything but what you're willing to walk in and face the pressure of. He said, you've asked a hard thing, but if you see me when I go, it'll be yours. And all of a sudden, a chariot of fire came along and took up Elijah and the mantle came down. And Elisha took up that mantle and cried out to God. He went back to the Jordan, struck it and said, Where's the God of Elijah? And the Jordan parted. And at the end of his life, he was known for twice the miracles. So anointed was his life that after his death, they threw a soldier in his grave who came back to life again. Yeah. That's anointing. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but it comes with a price. Yes, it does. Will you stand? See, in all of the nonsense narrative I have heard from so many sides over the past week and weeks, we've forgotten the narrative. Francis Scott Key in the War of 1812 on September 13th and 14th, 1814, was sent out to a ship to negotiate the release of men who had been taken prisoners of war. He successfully negotiated their release, but as he came back up, the admiral told him, you know, it won't really matter. These men are already free anyway. And he pointed out to Francis Scott Key on the horizon, there were over 200 British warships that were coming onto the scene. And he said, we are about to, to assault Fort McHenry. And Francis Scott Key begins to plead and, and, and to beg. And he said, that fort is filled with women and children. It is not a military installation. It is filled with civilians. He begged and he pleaded. And the Admiral said, you see that hill up there? 
You see that pole with that flag? We're going to begin our attack. And the only way we're going to stop that attack is if that flag comes down. That flag. And all through the night, the British assaulted Fort McHenry. That night, round after round after round assaulted the pole with the flag, but it continued to stand. And at the breaking of dawn, Francis Scott Key could see the flagpole still standing yet leaning slightly. And what had happened all through the night is every time the flag took a hit that could take it down, men held it until they were killed and their bodies fell. And another came and held it until they were killed and their bodies fell. And they held it until they were killed. And bodies piled one after the other till bodies held that flag in the air. It's about honor. I have not nor will I ever agree with anyone 100% who holds any office. But I will never dishonor the men who gave their lives and laid their bodies at the, at the foot of a pole for what this stands for. We have to reset why we do what we do. They laid their lives. I want you to stand to your feet. And I want you to, for the first time in your life, think about these words in light of that story. Together as voices only to sing our national anthem. Because if we are citizens of the United States, then our, then, our, then, our, then our freedom and our honor has nothing to do with agreeing with anyone in any office. It's about the blood that was shed. That's, that, that's, that's the blood. That's the price that was paid. So I'm going to begin. And I want you to sing it with me. I think we put it up there. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the rampart we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red blood the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave O'er oh, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Now we're going to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated for a moment. This, this flag, the Christian flag, is the representation of one who was hung on Mount Calvary who gave his all so that you could not only enjoy the freedom of a nation but the freedom of eternity and live forever with a 
God who loves you. See, many people don't even know there is a pledge to a Christian flag and a foundation by which we stand. And today, this may be the first time you've ever done this, but growing up as a kid, when we had a, a vacation Bible school, we didn't just do the pledge to the American flag. We did the pledge to the Christian flag. Now, this pledge requires a relationship with Jesus. See, saying a pledge to the flag without Jesus, Lord of your life, is just uttering some words. It doesn't give you any freedom unless you know Him. So I want us to stand once again. But before we say this pledge, I want every head bowed and every eye closed first. And I said I was doing a service to Christians and I believe that to be the truth. But I don't know where you stand. Maybe you know Christ, but you've got areas that you know are not right with Him. See, our allegiance doesn't stop at a nation. It doesn't stop with what we do or do not see. Our allegiance is to a God who gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. And today, I'm going to say three different areas. Number one, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, now is the time of salvation. If you made Him the Lord of your life, but you know that you are in a backslidden state, you are not serving Him as you should, or if you just have some uncertainties in your own heart and life, if you fit in any of those three categories, I want you to raise your hand. Anyone. Now is the time. Today is the day. Before we make this pledge, I want us to lift our hands. No one raised their hand, but I'm going to have us all make this declaration of faith together. Say, Father God, I believe Jesus died for me. I believe that in my heart. I confess with my mouth. He is my Lord and Savior. He's my King of Kings. And Lord of Lords, in Christ alone, I stand in Jesus' name. Now let's make this pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for which kingdom it stands. One brotherhood uniting all mankind in service and in love. Now, there's one last pledge that I want us to make. See, we have to be faithful in allegiance to this Word. Because it's His Word, not ours. So if you've got your Bible there, or if you've got your app, amen. amen. Let's make this declaration today. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's Holy Word. I will make it a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I will hide its word in my heart that I might not sin against God. Amen? Amen. See, today we set the narrative to be the light in our nation, guys. It doesn't take much to get wrapped around the axle and get into contention, but it takes self-control and letting God grow you and stretch you. See, see, self-control means we don't let our anger boil over quickly. There's a Greek word called macrothumia. It means you have a long wick. Anybody ever said, I have a short fuse? <laughs> Come on. Well, as believers, we're supposed to have a long one. Man. We're supposed to let God grow us to the place that that wick keeps growing and growing and growing and growing. And we don't let the wrath of man try to do the righteous things of God because it'll never work. Now, do we need to be angry when unholy and ungodly things are happening? I'm going to tell you what. 
I don't care what side of the equation you're on, if I see you or hear of you discriminating against anybody, I'm coming to talk to you. But if you see it, you stand up. And I'm not talking, well, somebody posted this and that. No. When you are in a store and somebody throws something at someone because they think that they're, they're, they're supposed to be their doormat, you stand up and say something. You see somebody treat uh, you know, a homeless person with disdain and disregard and disrespect, you stand up and say something. You see someone treat someone of another race on any side of the spectrum with disdain or disrespect, you say something. Because when you're present, it just became your business. See, we, 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 too many church people just stick their head, well, that's none of my business, but glory to God. I just had a great service. What if your actions led to that person coming to know the Jesus you serve? Because you stood up. Not because, you know, you wanted some camera in your face. See, sometimes people do stuff because there's cameras around. Yeah. Come on. Now, who you are is when no one's looking and there's no cameras rolling. That's right. See, that has to be our integrity and commitment as the body of Christ. That we're going to do it because it's what right, what's right, whether anyone ever knows it or not. See, we may not be able to fix everything, but we can influence everywhere we go. And our hearts should cry out like 2 Chronicles 7 says, If my people who are called by my name. He didn't say if a nation. He said if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I'll hear from heaven and I'll heal their land. By a show of hands, how many of you His people? Are you His people? Are you His people? You God's people? Then we humble ourselves. We call on our God and He heals, hears from heaven and He heals our land through us. Now if you have any prayer need today, I want you to come up. Any prayer need. I'm not trying to draw out service, but I'm not going to shortcut a need. Hallelujah. For the Just turn and face the me. To turn and face me. Forward, forward, forward. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your hand of restoration and healing upon the Lord. Lord God, we thank you. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made her free from every law of sin and death. And the blessing and life of God is at work in her right now. We thank you, God, Lord, for the restoration of every internal function. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Working the way you designed and created it to. Thank you, Lord. The 